Virtual hugs. Virtual Virtually? hugs. All right. Are we, uh, are we officially on? We're officially on. Okay, good to see everyone here this day. Beautiful uh, October day. Very uh, nice and cool out. It was really cool today when we first started up in the uh, outside service. So good to see everyone. Good to see you and uh, welcome everyone that's here uh, at our streaming service. Can't see you, but I feel you. No. Anyway, uh, it sounded good, didn't it? I feel them. So good to see you all, and uh, let me just give you a few announcements, and uh, just remember, as per the uh, uh, CDC, you're to wear a mask indoors, so it would be appreciated if you did, so that I don't get calls and texts about how many people don't have masks. Thank you. So uh, help a brother out, all right? Help a brother out. And plus, you know, there are... Uh, there are, you know, a couple churches nearby got closed down for a couple of weeks. I know we're just starting to get moving again. So, you know, they had a couple of cases or so uh, come out and then they were, you know, shut down for a couple of weeks, things like that. Um, you know, let's try to do what we can to avoid that. So uh, if you can't wear a mask, let me know and I will at least muzzle you in a good uh, headlock and that'll, no, I say that in good Christian love. All right, so uh, let me give you a few announcements. Again, good to see you. Here's the announcements. Uh, there is no evening service tonight. Uh, no evening service. Our next evening service will be on October 25th. Uh, and we're having a, um, a memorial service for Bill Sheldon that night. So uh, a lot of people, because of, uh, you know, the uh, COVID, uh, we can only have so many people. We had his uh, regular service for the family and things like that. So it's going to be a church service. So if you'd like to come, that's October 25th. And that'll be at 6 o'clock that Sunday evening. A couple other things. Uh, just remember that on Monday nights, there are two women's studies. And they are both available live and through WebEx. There's the kingdom of God is at hand. At Debbie's uh, study on Mondays at 6.30. And Haley does finding peace in the storm. And she does it live in WebEx as well. Tuesday mornings at 8.45, we have women who gather together here at the church for a prayer meeting. If you'd like to do that, you could be here at 8.45, 10 o'clock, we have a Bible study. That's for men and women. We meet in the gym for that. And Wednesday night, of course, uh, we do a uh, Bible study and a prayer meeting. Our new, oh, that's right, Awana's back. Impact meets on Thursday nights at 7. Uh, but Awana is back and uh, our teens meet. Uh, Wednesday nights, and we're also having our uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting. Our new study this week is the power of knowing God. Uh, so we have a little trailer for that. If you want to play that, that would be great. Trailer. Some people, some people know God only, know God only philosophically. philosophically. He's a concept. He's a concept. Other people know Other God people know information. God information. But God is after but God is after so, much so much more, much than, that. more than that. All through the Bible. All through the Bible. The one ingredient, the one you ingredient need, if you're serious if about, you're getting, serious to know about God, getting to know God, is a passion. Is a passion. You gotta want it. You gotta want it. If you don't if know you God, don't if you're not God, pursuing you're the, not knowledge pursuing God, the knowledge of God, that means your, your life, your is, life not being lived is not being for lived the for the purpose, the purpose you were created. We regularly hear people we say, well, I want to know God's will for, for my life, who aren't pursuing who aren't the person of God. The person of God. Don't go looking don't for the go plan. Looking for the plan. Look for the plan. Look for the plan. The Holy Spirit's job is to turn up the light so that you see God more clearly and experience Him more personally. Personally. When you are growing you are in your growing knowledge of God, knowledge of the, God life of the life of Christ is going to be reproduced in you. The Bible calls it the, the Bible fruit calls of the Spirit, the Spirit in, Galatians Spirit in Galatians 5. Your God who wants, to get, God, know, who wants to get to know you will use a crisis, use a crisis for deliverance so, so, so that you get to see and it. And so that you understand that, you understand that, that, that his wisdom that his is greater than your knowledge. I want you to come out, of this, to come out of this series with a fire that says, fire to, God, that says to God, I want to know you. I want to know I want to draw near to you. I want to draw near I want to experience you. I want to experience you. I want to abide with I you. Abide with I want to get close to you. I want to get close to you. I want to fulfill the purpose, I want to fulfill the that, you purpose have. that you have. I want to hear from you. I want to hear you. from you.
Yeah, it's going to start this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, so uh, hopefully we can see you for that. So that's what we have for announcements. And again, uh, good to see you all here. Uh, we have one more yes, song. Let's uh, stand and worship the Lord, then we'll get into the Word. This is an oldie but goodie. Jesus Messiah. Again, let's use it to worship him today.
hands in praise and worship today. He is Jesus Messiah. He is worthy to be praised. Pastor. Okay. Well, here we are, October 4th, 2020. Nice, like I said, a nice chilly day out there today. When I was a kid, my mom used to tell me to go outside when it was cold. Go stand outside and play, because it was kill, uh, kill the germs. So, uh, so I'm okay with cold weather. Not as much as I was before. I guess that's a sign of getting uh, on the other side, but <laughs> that's how that goes. So here we are, uh, two and a half months till Christmas. Two and a half months till Christmas, one month till election day. We have an election coming up, if you didn't know. And uh, up to this date, it's been quite a year. Up to this date, uh, Verrill told me it's uh, day, uh, day, about day 200 in the 15-day uh, flattening of the curve. So uh, it's been a year with a lot of ups and downs, that's for sure. Uh, a lot of twists and turns uh, in the... Uh, words of the great poet Buddy Holly every day, it's a getting closer, going faster than a roller coaster. Yes, it's been one of those years, up and down. Uh, of course, the big headline has been uh, COVID. Uh, this virus has brought the world economy and uh, nations to a halt. Many lives were lost, and here we are eight months into it, and it keeps dragging on where there's no end in sight. Uh, and we're at a time where, I don't know, as a people, if we're really uh, equipped as uh, maybe those in times past, uh, I think as a society, um, I don't remember anything really dragging on long, long. I mean, I can, you know, flu season comes and it lasts for four or five months and it's gone and, uh, you know, you see there's an end in sight. Uh, but this is being around for a while and it's going to be around for a while the way it looks, right? Um, Back in 1918, when you look at the Spanish flu outbreak, I went to history.com, and it says about the Spanish flu of 1918, it was the deadliest in history. It infected an estimated 500 million people worldwide. About one third of the planet's population killed an estimated 20 to 50 million people, including 675,000 Americans. Uh, it goes on to say, in one year, 1918, the average life expectancy in America plummeted by a dozen years. That's amazing, isn't it, when you think about it? Plummeted by a dozen years. Um, I don't know if, uh, how we would handle something like that at this time in our nation. Uh, I just think, I don't know, people seemed to be a lot tougher back then. Uh, back in 1918, they had just endured four years of World War I. It was just uh, getting over in, in 1918. It was a hard time, and I guess sometimes hard times make you tougher. Uh, of course, I'm painting with a broad brush, but I think we live in a time where we're just expecting things like this, this virus, to end quicker, for them to come up with a cure or something like that so we could get back to our lives and put this all behind us. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we're ready for the long haul, if there is one. Uh, besides the virus, because of it, many have lost jobs, uh, and who knows if they're coming back. Uh, we see stores closed and some not coming back. It always saddens me uh, when I see stores closing down. That, it was funny because my oldest daughter, Victoria, it was sometime years ago, and I had mentioned that. She says, me too. Isn't that funny? It just makes you feel sad. I mean, I was uh, up by the Morristown Mall and Sears closed. I mean... Do you know what Sears' motto used to be? Solid as Sears. Gone, you know. Just think, years gone by, we would have been, all of us would have been leafing through the Sears wish book by now, right? <laughs> Remember the Christmas catalog came out? The wish book. Man, that, that's when you knew it was Christmas. Wish book. No more wish book, okay? There's no more wishes for you. So this catalog is gone. Uh, been sad. 2020, we've seen rioting, we've seen looting in our cities, we've been barraged with 24-hour news that continually just shows us bad news. And then the other night, we were treated to a presidential debate uh, that was nothing close to presidential. Uh, I don't know if you got to see that or not. Uh, 
I decided to stay in and stick in for the whole thing because I knew it would have to change. <laughs> I gotta say, I, I left there with, uh, I had this angst in me. I did, I, when it was all over. I, I thought I, I've had some sessions like that in marriage counseling where you walk out like, <laughs> so that's what it was kind of like. As we, we had these two guys going at it, both sides uh, were kind of crazy, but I believe that um, God gives over nations to man to what they are. And I think what, that's what you're saying in a nation where you can't have any kind of uh, sane debate anymore. Um, I had to remind myself that as a Christian uh, that you never vote for a man, but you vote for a platform. Uh, we're never voting for a man. If you're voting for a man, I'm telling you, you're making a mistake. Okay, we've got to vote for a platform, and that platform is to be the one that really lines up closest to uh, God's will. I don't think you're going to get a perfect platform, but you've got to go to the one that is closest. Anyway, with all this going on in the nation, if you really looked at it, if you spent some time looking at the conditions of our world and of this nation, well, it could, you could walk away quite discouraged. And I'm sure each of us in this time, these eight months, have had battles of being discouraged. And that's just with that stuff. And then regular life goes on. And there's many things that can discourage us. Uh, we know as Christians that whatever is going on in the physical realm that is causing fear and divisiveness and injustice, it's the result of um, the spirit of Antichrist that's already existing in this world. Um, it's wreaking havoc on this world. Of course, the Christian knows this, but the natural man doesn't believe that. As a matter of fact, uh, they believe that if you believe that, then you're a kookaluk. <laughs> you're the problem. But uh, again, truth be told, Christian or not, all of this junk going on in this time can be quite discouraging. Uh, and discouragement is really one of the best tools that Satan has in his toolbox. Uh, and he will use discouragement to try to make people give up, uh, to give up serving the Lord, to give up on your family, to give up on your life. And let me say this, discouragement doesn't discriminate. Even the best Christians are under its power at times. Charles Spurgeon, he was quoted, he was the prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, that's what he was known as, and he was given, he was given over many times to depression and discouragement. So he was quoted as saying, I would not wish upon my worst enemy the depths of despair and discouragement I often feel for weeks or months at a time. Uh, John Wesley was given to discouragement. It says that in choosing a wife, he chose poorly. Uh, he chose the wrong woman. And uh, there was told that at times uh, she would drag him around the house by his hair. I'll tell you right now, in my house, that would happen one time. And then I'd shave my head. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's right, see? I'm shaving my head one time. That's it. Listen. You're not a bad Christian because you get discouraged, okay? All Christians have experienced discouragement. But you know what? We're not to really stay there. Some Christians make the mistake of thinking that once you get saved, that that's the end of all your troubles, okay? If getting saved is the end of troubles, then that's the front end. Because as Christians, our eyes are open to the truth, and we really see life as it is. And we know that there are troubles and there's trials uh, that come with life. The good news is, as Christians, we know that God is on our side and that he's with us in the trial and that he's growing us through the trial. Of course, no one likes trials. No one wants trials. Most of us want to live on easy street, but that address doesn't come up until after we leave this life. But for now, we're to carry our cross while running this race that's set before us. We're to keep pressing on and not lose heart. Of course, that's easier said than done because discouragement can be very debilitating. And if we allow it to take over, it can stop us really dead in our tracks. So how do we handle that? And what do we do? How do we keep from giving up? Giving up and, you know, on our marriage, giving up on our children, giving up on our church, giving up on our Christian walk. How do we do that? Because God doesn't want us to give up. He wants us to stay in the game. He wants us to keep pressing on 
Through the good times, through the bad, he wants us to keep trusting him, no matter how bad the storm looks around us. So how do we do that? Well, today we're going to go to the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to see just how uh, the enemy attacks and how we can have victory over that, this enemy, that, uh, this adversary that wants to discourage us to the place where we give up. Nehemiah was called by God to take a group of Jews back from captivity to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. And as always, whenever you go forth to do a work for the Lord, there will be opposition. So don't be, dis don't be surprised, okay? Here in Nehemiah, even though God had ordained the work, even though God moved the heart of a king to let Nehemiah and the group go back, even though he gave him letters and gave him the material that he would need to do it, there would still be opposition, outside forces to discourage the work of God and discourage the people of God. Jesus told his disciples that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Why did he tell them that? Because Satan is always looking to put up gates to close in the church, to hinder the work of the church. Okay? Again, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against his church, but he didn't say he wouldn't hinder the church, didn't say he wouldn't discourage the church. In chapter 2, we're going to be introduced to Sandballot. That's the guy's name, and his little toady named Tobias, and another name, a guy named Geshem, Geshem, the Arabian. When they hear that Nehemiah was there to rebuild the walls, if you look at verse 19, it says, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant and the Ammonite and Geshen the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? So we see the first opposition they're pointing to is, is ridicule. They're just ridiculing them. And then they bring in the government. Are you going to go against the government? Uh, it's funny how... Uh, you know, that's one of the first things they want to do is pit, uh, you know, the believer against the government. Uh, face it, sometimes that's all it takes, though, is ridicule to discourage a Christian, to stop them in their tracks. So this is another important reason for the church so, so that we're here to encourage one another. No, notice Nehemiah's response to ridicule, ridicule in verse 20. Then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore... We, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. So he stands up to them, saying the God of heaven is with them. Nehemiah knows that God has called them to this task. And so they go forth, and they begin working. In chapter 3, they rebuild the gates to the city, and they're succeeding in that work. So in chapter 4, the enemy moves from ridicule to anger. Follow me in Nehemiah 4.1. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we had built the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. So the mocking now increases. Uh, the anger has increased. And now they bring the army of Samaria with him in verse 2. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? And notice the name calling. Isn't it amazing the name calling that takes place? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned? So he's mocking them. And then again, little toady Tobias, he chirps in in verse 3. Now Tobiah, uh, the Ammonite, was with him. And he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Every time I read that, I think of uh, reading it. I read it outside like, even if they build, if a fox go up, he shall break it down, you girly man. I don't know why, it just sticks in my mind. That's like one of those, that's what goes on in my head. And remember when they would do that? You're the girly man. So that's, that's what it reminds me of. If a little fox go up, he pushed the wall down. I don't even know what accent that is, but that's just what goes on. At this time, the, the work is halfway completed. And notice Nehemiah's response to the ridicule, to the mocking, to the threats. Verse 4, here, 
O our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity and cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. We see he turns to prayer, and I'm going to tell you something. In this time where we're seeing so much discouragement, where we are seeing so much just junk going on in our nation, I'm telling you, as a people, we got to pray. Uh, we got to pray. Okay? But notice, they didn't just pray. You'll notice, then they continue working, verse 6. It says, so we built, so built we the wall. And all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Man, it's a great thing when people have a mind to work. Things get done when people come together to do something. But, of course, that doesn't stop the adversary in verse 7. It says, but it came to pass that when Sambalad and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth. Again, the anger keeps ramping up. You see, even though the people had a mind to work, we have to understand the adversary always has a mind to work. So they see this work going on and they're going to oppose it even more vehemently. Verse 8, and they conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Isn't it amazing how many that could be enemies will come together to fight against the cause of God? But we see Nehemiah, what does he do? Verse 9, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Again, we see prayer and an action, prayed and watched. They planned and they set a watch over the enemy by day and night. But it's not soon after this that this praying, this working, this watching begins to wear on the workers, verse 10. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of the burden is decayed and there is much rubbish so that we're not able to build the wall. And if it is... A, if, and if it is all work, you've got to understand, there's going to be a, a time where you're going to tire out. So they're saying uh, the strength of the bearers of burden is decayed. That's what he's saying. We're tired out. You've got to understand who's saying that. Notice it says Judah said. Judah is the chief tribe. They're the leaders among the nation. They're the ones that everyone looked up to. So they're saying we can't do it. We can't continue. They were worn out. You see, the opposition will use this as an opportunity now to uh, really pounce upon them because they're tired out. They've been working hard, and the task seems large. It seems like it's going nowhere. So they're losing their heart to work. And verse 6 tells us it's still only halfway done. But, you know, that's often where discouragement comes in, the halfway point. But right when we're in the, in the thick of it, the halfway point is interesting. I mean, think about it. When do you get tired of your car? When it's half paid for, right? When are you in school the most tired? Halfway, right after lunch. The afternoon drags, right? It's just the way it is. What's the most depressing part of winter? Halfway. Waiting for it to get done. Okay, where are we at this sermon? Halfway. <laughs> I mean, what's the most discouraging time for men? Midlife crisis, right? You've heard of the midlife crisis. Guy looks at his life and stands in front of the mirror and looks at his body. It gets discouraging, right? looks at his job, thinks about his goals, thinks about his dreams. And all of a sudden, all those things, all his hopes and dreams just seem to not be what he had thought they would be. So what does he do? He decides it's time to buy a sports car. <laughs> it's time to buy a sports car. So the world will know, I still got it. Back when I was of age of midlife crisis, I like when people say, oh, you're having a midlife crisis. I'm not living to 120. Okay, so back in those days, I remember saying, you know, I told my wife, 
about time for me to have a midlife crisis. She goes, you're not having one. I said, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> so, you know what, I'm glad you have the clear shield so at least I could see you smiling because if I didn't, I would never know what's going on. So thank you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You see, it's in the middle where we want to turn back. It's the middle where we want to stop. It's the middle where we want to give up. The men of Judah, they're worn out physically, emotionally, psychologically. They're worn out. They're tired out and they're discouraged. They look around after all the work that they had put in. And what do they say in verse 10? There's much rubbish so that we're not able to build the wall. They had miles to go is what they're saying and their focus has changed from the work that they were called to do. Now they're looking at what's left. They're saying there's rocks everywhere and it's just too much. We're tired out. Notice verse 10. It starts with Judah said and then it ends with saying that we are not able to build. It's amazing how that discouragement spread through the rest of the tribes. I mean, Judah was the top tribe. They were the tops. They were the big ones. They were the heroes. You know, it says when the big cedars fall, it affects many of the small firs underneath of them. And this is what's happening. This discouragement begins to spread in the camp. I'm going to tell you something in this time in which we live, in these uncertain times, where so many are really being challenged in the faith, where so many are separated from the flock, either because they're among the high-risk groups and, and they're still concerned about coming out to a service. People need to know that we're here for them. And then we have the others who maybe have just gotten comfortable with watching on TV. Let me again, say the streaming service is great, but it doesn't replace church. Because church is more than hearing a message. You could hear messages throughout the day, any day. It's about being with one another. It's about encouraging one another because you could get very discouraged at this time. So again, let me challenge you folks that, you know, you don't have any issues. You're around doing life everywhere, but you're staying home because it's convenient and it's comfortable. Let me just tell you something. Don't complain that the state has made the church unessential because you're making the church unessential by staying home when you can come out and you should come out because you know what? There's people here who need to see you and need to be encouraged by you. Just the way it is. Judah is the largest tribe and they're discouraged and it's spread. And now the adversary is going to jump on board and fan the flames in verse 11. And our adversary says, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times from all places, when shall you return unto us, they will be upon you. Notice what happens here. This is really, we're seeing the propaganda machine of the enemy. That they said we're going to attack, but then now they begin to plant rumors around. See, in the outlying areas where the Jewish population, where those who came back were living amongst these people, they began to spread rumors saying that we're planning an attack. And notice they come back to Nehemiah and they say ten times over, which means they repeated it many times that the enemy was going to attack and it was going to come from all different directions at all different times and there was no way you could get away. I shared this many times with you, this, uh, the way the adversary, our adversary attacks. It's something I learned very early on in my Christian life and it was one of those things that always stuck with me. But I'll share it with you again because I think you see it here very clearly. How the adversary attacks. Uh, the first way is propaganda. The second way is infiltration, and lastly, direct attack. So what do I mean by this? Uh, well, let's take a moment and break this down. We know, again, that we're to put on the whole armor of God, the Bible tells us, so that we could stand against the wiles of the devil, the trickery of the devil. 
Here's the fact. The devil and his demons study us so well that they know our tendencies. They know right where to attack, right when to attack. They know the weak link on each of our chains. They know that. You see, that's what they do. So they're so well organized in their attacks. It seems like they're in our minds, although the devil can't read our mind. So let us remind ourselves a couple things. One, let us understand the way the devil works. Because as he's studied our tendencies, I think we need to know some things about him. So that we could stand in the wicked day. So we could understand what he uses. Of course, his greatest tool is deception. The devil cannot force a believer to do anything. We like to say the devil made me do it, but that's a lie. You see, because the Bible tells us greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. The devil cannot make us do anything. He can't force us to do anything, so he has to trick us. He has to lay out the bait and put out the lure to get us to bite. And he does it in those times when we are weak. He does it in those times when we're discouraged. So this first tool he uses is propaganda since the battlefield is in the mind, right? And that's exactly where propaganda goes, into the mind. If the devil could get our minds thinking away from the truth of God, then he has us. If the devil could fill our minds with thoughts, because that's what he does, he barrages our minds so that we begin to listen to what he's saying and take in his thoughts and allow his thoughts to become our thoughts. That's where you get a stronghold. It becomes part of our lives. It's how we feel. And everybody knows, man, if you feel a certain way, it's hard to break the way somebody feels. But this is what happens, and this is why he attacks the mind, because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So he barrages us with propaganda. We have faced propaganda from advertisers for years. We're inundated daily with propaganda on what to wear, on what to eat, on what to buy. And now with the computer, all the world is at our fingertips. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is in our homes, and it's on our smartphones, it's in our pocket. It's right here. Now big tech companies and social media, they have mastered the art of propaganda. You ever notice something? You look something up on the phone, you're barraged with ads about that thing you looked up. What's even scarier, you ever talk about something and see it on your phone? Boy, that's a crazy thing, isn't it? When that happens, and we're shocked by it. You know, they know everything. And then, of course, we have our friend Alexa. You know, she knows everything. Alexa. Yeah. I heard recently one of the big tech guys said that they can sway voters' minds to get them to vote how they want them to vote for the person that they've picked. That's pretty wild stuff, isn't it? I believe that there's been a massive propaganda campaign during this whole pandemic. I believe the pandemic, oh, oh, I believe the virus is real. I, I believe that. I mean, we see it, the president, right? He has it. And even those, it's an amazing thing, right? There's those who say, no, it's, that's a scam. <laughs> if you have it, you don't have it. It's just a cra it's crazy. This world is going crazy. I believe the virus is very real. But I also believe that there are those who will use this to groom the minds of the masses. I'm convinced of that to get people in line for their ultimate agenda, to push across their world agenda, to usher in what the Bible teaches is a new world order. That's not a conspiracy theory, by the way. That's Bible teaching. Okay? Mind you that everything doesn't have to look bad, by the way. You know, just moving us to a cashless society makes it easier that you don't have to pay with cash. I never have, if people come up to me and they want cash, I never have cash on me. I know what you're saying, you got four daughters. Well, yeah, that's true too. That's, <laughs> but I, I don't carry cash with me, I got a card. I don't even need a card. Now I got this little thing, my phone, boop, it's right there. We're, we're being programmed into it, right? Just the way it is. You see, propaganda is the big tool of the devil. 
to capture the minds of people. And again, it's, a, it's part of the spiritual battle. That's why we are told to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring cap, into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Everything has to line up itself with the word of God. What does God say about it? You see? Here in Nehemiah, in Nehemiah, they're using fear as a big tool in their propaganda campaign. We're coming at you from every direction, and you won't even realize it. Fear is a big part of the adversary's propaganda program because no one wants to live in fear. So what are we seeing? We're constantly seeing fear-mongering brought out there. I mean, did you ever see so much about fear in your life? But this is what's happening. And you know it has to be that way because when the Bible talks about the end times, it says, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them. All you're hearing is people want to be safe. People want to, you know, don't want to fear and this and that. So you have to ramp up fear to get people lined up. It's just the way it goes. Notice how many times you hear it in the, in the campaigns on both sides. You know, people want peace. They want safety. So we see this propaganda machine. First way the devil attacks. The second is infiltration. Notice in verse 11. The adversary said they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them. The devil works that way. You see, he softens up our minds so that we begin to think and act like he does. We're doing this study on culture shock on our small groups. And you know what you're seeing? More and more, the church is acting like the culture, not different than the culture. Why? Because we're buying into that. Because the world's job, they want to conform us into their way. So we're buying into that stuff. And the more we let those things in, the more we become a target. You know, we saw it best at Operation Desert Storm. Remember Desert Storm? That was kind of, you know, in Vietnam War, we saw a video of the war. But Desert Storm, remember seeing it in real time? You remember being in your, watching the news and you're amazed that you're saying, wow, you see them pinpointing targets and you see the missile come down and you're watching it in real time. It was amazing. The question was, how were they able to shoot these missiles from these Navy ships and pinpoint these targets? How, did, how were they doing? I mean, they weren't just lofting willy-nilly at these things. They had targets. Because before any bomb was ever launched, we sent Delta forces into Iraq and they sent back the coordinates to let them know where to strike. We had infiltrated that nation. And that's exactly what happens. The devil is always infiltrating. He's sowing what? The weeds among the wheat. Paul says to the church of Ephesus that beware, false teachers will rise up from within you to draw people away. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We need discernment like never before. Because we have access to every person out there who wants to say something. We need discernment. It's important that we are careful to who we watch and who we listen. It says in Romans 16, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For they are such that serve not the Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. After filling our minds with his lies so that we allow this stuff to creep into our homes and churches and our lives, then we are a pushover for direct attack where he just bears down on us. Look at the final verse, uh, last part of that verse. It says they're going to sneak in and then and slay them and cause the work to cease. The devil is never going to be happy until he can stop the work of God. Nehemiah in 4.10 again tells us the strength of the bearer's burden is decayed. There's much rubbish. The adversary attacks when we are at our weakest and when our lives are filled with rubbish, too many distractions. He comes at us when we take our focus off the Lord and, and we begin to look at the work that it's too hard. 
So what do we see here? We see they're discouraged. They want to give up while their work is halfway done. But you know what? Nehemiah wasn't going to throw in the towel. He understood his purpose for being there. So he devises a plan. Go with me to verse 13. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. One, he armed the people. He says, we're going to take the enemies, we're not going to take the enemy's advances lying down. He gave them swords and spears and bows. Now, I'm talking spiritual warfare. Okay? So... You can't use physical weapons in a spiritual war. So you understand that. Don't go home saying, hey, pastor said get all spears and weapons and bows. That's not, that's it. We're talking spiritual warfare, okay? We have to understand God gives us spiritual weapons because physical weapons won't work in a spiritual war. Think about it. We already know what Satan's going to try to do. He wants to attack us and discourage us so we're foolish if we don't prepare ourselves. That's why the Bible tells to put on the whole armor of God so that we could stand in the evil day. Put that armor on. And listen, it's God's armor that we need, not a substitute. A lot of times we look for a different type of armor, a different substitute. Remember when David was going to fight King Goliath? Uh, he was going to fight Goliath. King Saul said, here's my armor. David says, I can't wear your armor. It's not proved. I, I've never worn this before. I can't, can't use that. David didn't want somebody else's armor. So in this battle against discouragement, listen, we need God's armor. Don't try to be encouraged by something other than Christ because everything else is just a Band-Aid. So some people, they, they try drugs. They try alcohol. Some people go the other way, try hobbies, try, you know, all these different things. They're all Band-Aids. So what does it take to lift us from this time of discouragement? Well, it's no temporary help is going to be good enough. It's going after Jesus Christ. You understand it's going after Jesus. I was talking on Wednesday night. Uh, we showed a video from Psalm 119. And the speaker over there said, you know what? As believers, we should, we should never be fully content in our relationship with God. Now, it doesn't mean not content about the things, you know, of life. He's saying in that relationship, he's saying God is the eternal one. You can never exhaust God, so we should always have this desire to pursue after him in a deeper way. Whether you're saved 10 years or 50 years, we should always be pursuing after him in a, in a deeper way. So he called it Wednesday night a holy discontentment, not being displeased by the physical realm, things you don't have, but you know what? That you want to know God in a deeper way. That you're not satisfied with just this shallow knowledge of God, but you want to know him deeper. And he goes on to mention the different heroes of this faith, how they all had this longing. It was Moses who said, show me your glory. He didn't say, show me the money. It was David who says, as a deer pants for water, so my soul longs for thee. Paul, 35 years after being saved, he says, I want to know him. Do you understand what it's saying? That we're to be longing after him. And I, I believe, you know, Pastor Gary and I were talking the other day. We're saying it's interesting. We find this interesting thing that when a, a new small group is launched or a new Bible study is launched, you know what you see? You see people for uh, the first week, maybe the second week, and then a drastic fall off. And we were talking about it. And, and you know what I think it is? I, uh, too many Christians are looking for some easy fix. They're looking for this magic pill that's going to fulfill them in the Christian life. You know, everybody's looking for the magic pill, right? Everybody, where's that magic pill of weight loss? So that I could eat all the ice cream I want, take a pill, and I'm fine. Right? Right? All the magic pills that they promise you on TV, you take this pill, and they showed a guy being ripped, the legend, you know, the legendary abs and all this stuff. Every magic pill they show, you know what they say? This pill with diet and weight loss will, you see, the pill means nothing. But we're looking for a magic pill in Christianity. 
So we'll give it a try. I'm going to try this study. Maybe this is the thing that's going to do it for me. Or I'm going to try this study. Maybe this will. And then there's no change. And then you drop off. You see, let me tell you something. Here's the Christian life. It's a constant pursuit of Jesus. That's it. It's a constant pursuit of Jesus. That's where, <laughs> that's it. The problem is, you know what? We drift. We fade. The study that we're doing Wednesday night, I'm going to tell you, dealing with the power of knowing God. It was funny how this kind of rolled in. It's amazing how God works. The Holy Spirit works. The power of knowing God. And how important that is in the Christian life. I mean, how can you trust someone unless you really know them? After arming the people, and he, you notice the wisdom of Nehemiah, he placed their families with him. He does a second thing. Go to verse 14. He says, And I looked up and rose up and there and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. Nehemiah encourages the people. He says, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. You know, if Nehemiah was written in the New Testament, he would have probably quoted Romans 8.31. If God be for us, who could be against us? Psalm 54, behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. Everybody knows Isaiah 40.31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Encouragement is is the opposite of discouragement. Some people have that gift of encouragement. Sadly, some people have the gift of discouragement. But in a nutshell, here's what happens. When, when we buy into the propaganda, when we allow culture to conform us to their ways, we set ourselves up for attack. But the reason that the, the adversary's ways are effective against us come down to one thing. We take our eyes off the Lord. We take our eyes off the Lord. So let me ask you today. Are you discouraged? Are you discouraged? It can happen. These are tough times. Then turn your eyes upon Jesus. Because that's the answer. I know people think, you know, it's funny. Because when you, when you see little kids in, you know, in Sunday school, right? There's two answers. You ask a question, you know. Uh, who led the Israelites across the Red Sea? Jesus. No. God. You know, it's two answers. Jesus, God. Right? But for some reason, when we get older and, and you know, the preacher says you've got to turn your eyes upon Jesus, people are looking for something more. We're called Christians because we're to follow Jesus. We're pursuing after him. He's the answer. People say, oh, it's too simple. Really? Then why aren't we doing it? If it's that simple... Why aren't we doing it? We're to keep our eyes on him. We're to abide in him, uh, abide in his word, spend time in his presence. Let me tell you something. Peace is not found in the absence of trouble. It's found in the presence of God. So where do we find his presence? Right where I just told you, man. You, you abide in his word. You spend time in his word. You spend time in prayer. These are the basic tenets of the Christian life. And you know what you do? You, you come to church because we, as the church, we are the body of Christ. We're to pick up one another. We're to encourage one another. We're to love one another. Just go through to one another's in the scripture. Nehemiah did something else as well. Verse 14. After he says, remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. He says, fight for your brother and your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. You know what he did? He stirred their heart. You know what he's saying? There's too much at stake right now to be discouraged. There's too much at stake right now to stop. He says, this is not the time to quit. Now listen, we, we're not building walls, but I'll tell you right now, in this culture, we're fighting for our families. We're seeing this culture want to destroy family. It's just the way it is. Do away with the patriarchal family. Destroy the family. We're fighting for our families, folks. You've got to understand that. 
For us, the glory of God is at stake. So don't give up. Don't give up on the work of the church. Don't give up on your marriage because that's a picture of Christ and his church. Don't give up on your children. Don't give up on what God has called you to do. There are many things out there that, you know, the devil will use to discourage us, to take us off the work of the Lord. But there's too much at stake. So I would hope that each of us would stay encouraged. How do we fight against an enemy, an enemy we cannot see? Just like he said, remember the Lord, who is great and terrible. This morning, we're going to do that when we go into communion. We're remembering the Lord. You know, he's the greatest example of the one who overcame the adversaries he faced. And he came out victorious. It says this in Hebrews 12, 1. Don't zip up yet, because just because I said I was going to communion, don't mean I'm going there yet. I hear the zips going. That's the, oh, he's done. Zip, zip. Don't zip up yet, because I ain't done yet. But in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin that so easily besets us. Let us run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us. I like when it says, Wherefore, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, that is talking about chapter 11, the hall of faith. And if you were to get every one of those ones in chapter 11, those great heroes of the faith, what is he saying? Call them to the witness stand, and you know what they will testify? That run after Jesus, he's worth it. He says, we're compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets us. You know what we need to do? Stop looking at the rubbish. Isn't that the problem that... They had with Nehemiah, they were looking at the rubbish. Stop looking at the rubbish, those things that want to knock us off our course and refocus on the Jesus, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice, this is not talking about the power of positive thinking, like, oh, hard times aren't existing. Jesus endured the cross. But his focus wasn't on the cross. It was on the victory that was to come when he rose again. Amen. And this is what it's talking about to us. Yes, we will endure these times. But don't give up. Keep pressing on. Keep moving forward. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Because it says in verse 3, Consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied, discouraged. And faint in your minds, give up. Our adversary at this time has opened his toolbox to discourage Christians from finishing the work we've been given to do. This is not the time to give up and you know, grow weary and stop. This is the time we got to press on. So if the junk of this world has you down, I'll tell you right now, it's just another one of, you know, I'm big on gauges. It's just a gauge saying, you know what, I've taken my eyes off Jesus. It's one thing that to be discouraged every once in a while, it's almost impossible not to. But we should never stay discouraged. Because as I read it, Jesus rose from the grave. And he says that even though we're going to have trouble on this side, we could be of good cheer because he's overcome the world. As we go into communion today, let's remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. Remember the price he paid. Remember the injustice that he faced. In this world, we're going to face injustice. But no one faced injustice more than Jesus did. The sinless one being crucified by the sinners. Today, I spoke to believers. As we go into communion, communion is for believers. If you're a person here that you've never come to the saving knowledge of Christ, that you think you could be good enough to get to heaven on your own. You've got to work your way to heaven. You need the sacraments to get to heaven. Anything other than Jesus alone, then you need to get saved. 
It's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that he just existed, but that on that cross, what we're celebrating today, with the bread, he took your sin upon his body. And he paid for that sin with his blood. And it's only through faith in his completed work that you can be forgiven of your sins and saved. Saved from the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death. So if you've never done that, if you've never called out to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I'm separated from you, but I believe that on that cross, Jesus paid for my sins. I believe he rose again. And you receive him by faith. You ask him to come into your life by faith alone. If you've never done that, then communion is not for you. So maybe in this time, before we have communion, why don't you do just that? It's a, again, it's, it's an acknowledgement that I can't save myself. I can never be good enough, but I believe that what Jesus did was enough. And just in your prayer before God, God, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus to save me. And he'll do just that. Shortest prayer in the Bible. Peter sinking in the water. Lord, save me. And it says, Jesus reached down and pulled him out. I'm telling you right now, if you've never trusted Christ, you're sinking in a sea of sin. And he's only an arm's length away. Call out to him and you could be saved today. For us who have done that, this is a special time. It's a special time to know that God loved us enough to send his son to pay a debt that we could never pay. Not only did he save us, give us eternal life, but he's here with us now to encourage us on the journey. So if you've been down, if you've taken your focus off of Jesus, why don't today be that day you say, Lord, forgive me. I am prone to wonder. I'm prone to leave the God I love. Forgive me. By your grace, I want to refocus on you. Don't you praise God that he's a seeking savior, that when we go astray, he's there finding us. As we go into communion, let's take a moment just to go before the Lord. Confess our sins, the Bible says. He's, more, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And then we'll share this time of communion. Let me just give you a few moments here between you and God. And then we'll have this time of communion. Paul writes that I've received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for this bread. We thank you for the body of Jesus that this bread symbolizes that we could remember the price he paid in love for us as we were dead in trespasses and sins yet he would die for a people like us. So we thank you for Jesus. We ask your blessing in this time knowing that if he could die for us when we were lost in sin, how much is he there for us now so that we could live for him in these troubling times. We thank you for his presence in our lives. We ask your blessing on this bread in Jesus' name. Amen. Take, eat, remembering him.
After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you for the cup. This cup of juice representing the blood of Christ, the precious blood of Jesus that paid for all of our sins and enabled us to be set free, to have victory over the adversary. We ask your blessing on this cup in Jesus' name. Amen. Take drink, remembering him. Father, thank you for this time of communion. Thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for the great salvation that we have. Thank you that when this all wraps up, we know to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. That as believers, we have a great future, no matter what the adversary may say. Help us to continue pressing on. Help us to be about your business, for there's so many souls out there that need to know about Jesus. Use us mightily for your kingdom and your glory. We pray. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, then. Let's stand as we close out our service with Mighty to Save. 